Namaste and welcome to another interesting Facebook live session. Gallstones. Gallstones are small solid particles that form in the gallbladder which can cause discomfort and disrupt normal digestive functions. Gallbladder disorders encompass a range of issues affecting the organ's health and functionality. It is very important to understand the complexities of gallstones and gallbladder disorders and take proactive steps to prevent their formation. We are very privileged today to have with us Dr. J.K.A. Jamil, Senior Consultant, Surgical Gastroenterology and Minimal Access Surgery at Apollo Hospitals, Greens Road, Chennai, to share his thoughts into this topic. With expertise in gallstones and gallbladder disorders, Dr. Jamil would shed light on advancements in and the treatment options available today. A very warm welcome to our Facebook live session, Doctor. Good Thank you for having me. Let's start with the most common question, Doctor. What are the symptoms of gallstones? There are a wide variety of symptoms that patients who develop gallstones get. Uh, the most common symptom is pain in the abdomen. It's a pain that is typically in the upper part of the abdomen. Um, more often on the right side. It's a pain that can travel to the back, sometimes to the right shoulder. And uh, it is also described uh, as a pain that gets often worse after a fatty meal. So that's the most common uh, symptom. But then uh, there can be other symptoms too, like uh, um, a feeling of gas bloat, some nausea. And uh, rarely, uh, patients can also have jaundice. Now, if I have to clarify this in a bit more detail, what I can do is divide it into uh, symptoms that patients get when the gallstone is within the gallbladder and symptoms that patients get when the gallstone has come out of the gallbladder and slipped into the bile duct. And when they are in the gallbladder, they can have pain, as I said, gas bloat and uh, some nausea and so on. Uh, and if the gallbladder gets infected, they can even get fever. But if they come out of the gallbladder and enter the bile duct, they can block the bile duct and they can cause jaundice. We call it as obstructive jaundice because it's obstruction to the bile. Um, sometimes they can even block the junction of the bile duct and the pancreatic duct and they get a condition called pancreatitis, which is an extremely painful condition. Uh, so that's in a nutshell about what gallstones can do. And of course, there's also a group of patients who have gallstones but don't have any uh, symptoms. So we, we, we put them in a separate category called asymptomatic gallstones. So what are the risk factors, doctor, that increase the likelihood of developing gallstones? To, uh, to understand this, we need to uh, have an understanding of what uh, uh, bile is. So bile is a liquid. It, it's, uh, it's, it, it has many things uh, in it, amongst which there is bile salts, bile pigments and cholesterol. Now bile salts and bile, bile salts and cholesterol have to remain in a specific ratio uh, for the bile uh, to, to be in liquid state and bile pigment also has to be in a, in, a, in a particular percentage. When the ratio is altered or when there is an increased amount of bile pigment in the bile, um, the, 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 the bile which is supposed to be in a liquid state solidifies and can turn into gallstones. Now, any any condition that makes the bile turn from the liquid state, the normal liquid state, to a kind of a, uh, a solidified state, making it to form gravel or stones, are, are, is considered as a risk factor. So, if there is increased amount of cholesterol, fat in the bile, uh, gallstones can develop. So, that is a risk factor, high cholesterol. If there is an increased amount of bile salts, which can happen in certain uh, medical conditions, gallstones can occur. If there is an increased amount of bile pigments, which can happen in certain conditions, particularly the conditions uh, like uh, which, which involve too much of uh, uh, hemolysis, as in breakdown of blood cells, gallstones can develop. And uh, and and uh, the the other uh, um, risk factors are are related to the, the amount of uh, functioning or the contraction that the gallbladder does. If it is not contracting adequately, the bile tends to remain static within the gallbladder for a long period of time. 
and that can cause gallstones too. So, there is a long list of uh, things that can be said, but to summarize it is about the ratio of the bile salts and the cholesterol, it is about the percentage of bile pigment and the ability of the gallbladder to contract and, and, and dilate um, uh, which in turn determines the amount of bile stasis within the gallbladder that causes gallstones. Doctor, are there any genetic factors that play a role in the development of gallstones? Uh, nothing has been uh, uh, proven uh, without doubt at this point in time, but uh, but there are reports to suggest that genes may have a role to play in in gallstone development. Doctor, what are the treatment options available for treating gallstones? Yeah, so um, the treatment for patients with symptomatic gallstones uh, depends on whether the gallstones are present only in the gallbladder or whether they are present in the gallbladder and in the bile duct. So, that is the broad categorization. If they are present only in the gallbladder, the treatment of choice, the one that is recognized worldwide and that has been proven beyond doubt to be the best and the permanent solution for these kind of problems is a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which basically means a, a keyhole operation to have the entire gallbladder removed. If the gallstone is present in the gallbladder and in the bile duct, so the treatment becomes a two-step approach. It is not just doing the laparoscopic cholecystectomy and forgetting about it because we now have to deal with two problems. One is a problem within the gallbladder, the other is a problem in the bile duct. So, the two-step approach uh, goes like this patient first has an endoscopic treatment, we call it as ERCP, uh, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreaticogram, that is the expansion for it. So, the tube is passed through the through the mouth, the tube goes all the way down to the duodenum, which is a tube which is a part of the intestine next to the stomach and through the duodenum, uh, the bile duct is accessed and the stone in the bile duct is removed. So, the bile duct needs to be cleared needs to be free of stones uh, first. So, that is the that is the that is the priority that needs to be done first. Once the bile duct is cleared, the gallbladder with the stones needs to be addressed and that is a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So, for the first category of patients, it is just laparoscopic cholecystectomy. For the second category of patients, it is ERCP followed by laparoscopic cholecystectomy. You mentioned about laparoscopic cholecystectomy, doctor. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about it? Could you elaborate about it in terms of what happens during the procedure? Uh, when is it advised for patients and how many days would the patient have to stay at the hospital? And is it a, can be done can be done as a daycare procedure? Could you please elaborate? Yeah, that? sure. So, uh, laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopy is a, is a general uh, term. We, it is a term which is, uh, which we use for operations that is performed in the abdominal cavity by making few holes in the abdomen as opposed to making a cut. So, that is a general word, laparoscopy. Cholecystectomy is the word for removal of the gallbladder. So, laparoscopic cholecystectomy essentially means a an operation wherein we remove the gallbladder by making a few holes in the abdomen. It is a very common procedure, very, very common procedure and it is a standardized procedure. Um, we perform by making four holes in the abdomen, in the upper part of the abdomen. It is done under general anesthetic, uh, but it is usually a very short procedure. So, a short general anesthetic and a, and, a, and a short operation. Most of the time, of course, if the gallbladder is, is terribly inflamed and if it uh, if it's stuck inside, uh, it might take longer. But by and large, most of these procedures are done within an hour. The idea is to go in and remove the gallbladder in its entirety along with all the stones. Patients often ask, doctor, can you just remove the stones and leave the gallbladder uh, intact? Uh, that is not an option. It is not uh, the right thing to do uh, because, because the gallbladder itself is diseased in these kind of patients and it, it has to be removed in its entirety. Um, it is a very well tolerated operation. Most of the time, patients who have 
these kind of laparoscopic cholecystectomies, simple and straightforward laparoscopic cholecystectomies are, are out of their beds and are able to go to the toilet unassisted, are able to have a normal diet within 6 to 8 hours after they have the operation. And uh, uh, most of the time, these patients are even ready for discharge within about 10 hours after the operation. So, uh, so that brings me to the next question that you ask: Can they be done as a daycare procedure? Yes, certainly they can. Um, so, if they are young patients, if they are reasonably fit and healthy, um, we bring them in to the hospital at uh, six in the morning, seven in the morning, after the after an overnight fast, uh, and we get them done in the first half of the day, and they are back home. Uh, by 6 or 7 in the evening and they sleep in their own beds. They don't need a hospital bed. So that's how simple this, uh, this operation is performed. And when uh, can they resume normal activities, doctor? Um, uh, straight away. I mean, if, if, it, if the job doesn't involve any heavy lifting or if it is not the kind of a job that, uh, um, that requires them to put too much of pressure in their, in their tummy muscles, I generally tell them, get back to your normal activities within a few days. Uh, so if it is a desktop, if it is a desk job, uh, and if the person needs to be back on his office table, sitting in front of a computer and doing his job on a Monday, he can have his operation on a Friday and still be able to go to work on Monday. So, That's great. Yeah. And uh, a most frequently asked question: yeah. Can gallstones be managed without surgery? Yeah. Um, See, uh, there is a group of patients who have gallstones but have never experienced any symptoms pertaining to gallstones. It's a, it's a recognized group. We, the we, asymptomatic we, group exactly, that you we, mentioned. We call them as asymptomatic, asymptomatic cholelithiasis. Cholelithiasis means stones in the gallbladder. Asymptomatic means no symptoms. So, there's a group of patients uh, who come under that category, asymptomatic cholelithiasis. Now, they can be left alone, but there are several parameters that we look at before telling them that this is not something that requires any surgical intervention at this point in time. Uh, what we say is uh, we have to adopt a wait and watch policy in those kind of patients because you never know when they will they will get symptoms. So it is not just about saying, you know, you don't have any symptoms, therefore forget about it completely. You will never require treatment. That's not the right thing to say. Uh, what we generally tell them is, look, at this point in time, your 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 stones ha haven't got any, haven't uh, created any trouble, um, and there aren't. They, it doesn't look like you have any of the uh, severe risk factors for me to recommend surgery, although they are not symptomatic. However, you need to be aware that these stones can cause, you know, problem A, problem B, problem C, problem D, problem E. And uh, it's very important that you are aware of all these problems. And if and when those problems occur, seek medical attention immediately. Uh, after hearing all that, the patient may choose to have the operation done straight away because you never know when those problems would happen and you never know if you would have access to good medical facility at the time of the occurrence of the problem. So, some patients, even if they are asymptomatic, they choose to get it done. And, we, and there's a good reason for that. They might, you know, they say, well, doctor, I'm all right now. I would rather get them, get it sorted now because when I get the pain, the place where I live, the village where I live hasn't got the kind of facilities that we have here. So, I might as well get it done while I'm here. So, that's, that's a reasonable way of thinking too. Uh, but then, yes, uh, symptomatic gallstones, you know, as in if the if the gallstone causes problem, there is no there is no room for discussion there. It needs to be treated, and a laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a treatment. But asymptomatic gallstones, there is a provision for discussion, and it needs to be a healthy uh, and a fully informed discussion between the patient and the doctor, uh, and then they come to a conclusion. If you want to get it done, get it done. If you want to wait and watch, wait and watch. As long as you know um, what are the complications, what, what kind of what? problems. Uh, uh, can can occur at a later date. Uh, can gallstones lead to more serious complications, doctor? And if so, what are they? Uh, yes, they can. Uh, in fact, I touched upon one of them in my earlier answer when I talked about symptoms. 
if the gallstone slips out of the gallbladder and goes into the bile duct and uh, blocks the junction of the bile duct and the pancreatic duct, uh, patients can develop a condition called pancreatitis. It's called acute gallstone pancreatitis. It is a serious condition. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it causes severe abdominal pain, and it is not just the pain part of it. It can also cause a lot of uh, disruption to the system, to the body as such. People with acute pancreatitis can have problems with uh, blood pressure, with pulse, with urine output, uh, with the neurological status even, with their blood coagulation. It can affect big time. Uh, again, uh, I don't. It's very difficult for me to go into the details of all of it in a session like this. But acute acute pancreatitis, sufficient is it is to say, um, is, is a condition which has a wide spectrum of presentation. It can be uh, anywhere from just causing a bit of pain and then recovering within a few days to a, to uh, causing multi organ failure and death. So that's how big a spectrum. Uh, it can present with. So, we don't know, you know, which uh, part in that spec we will get, uh, we will fall in when we develop that complication of gallstone, which is stone migrating from the gallbladder into the bile duct. If it is a mild attack, fair enough, it, it will get better and uh, you will have your gallbladder taken out at a later date. What if it is a severe attack? You know, we are, uh, we are putting ourselves into a situation where we are going to be in the hospital for days, if not weeks. So that's a very serious complication that needs to be um, uh, borne in mind when 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 you are dealing with gallbladder problems. Number one, number two, there is something called gallbladder cancer. Just like just like you you know people get cancer in the stomach, cancer in the colon, cancer in the rectum, um, people can get cancers in the gallbladder too. One of the risk factors for gallbladder cancers is gallbladder stones. Not to suggest that everybody who has gallbladder stones will you know, will progress on to developing cancer, but then a risk factor uh, is, 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 you know, is something that, if present, puts yourself at an increased predisposition of developing that particular disease. Risk factor should not be understood as cause. It's a bit like smoking and lung cancer. Smoking is a risk risk factor for lung cancer. That doesn't mean that every smoker in Every smoker is going to develop lung cancer for sure. No, it doesn't work that way. Cause, effect is different from risk factor and disease. And doctor, what is the connection between gallbladder stones and certain medical conditions like diabetes or maybe a heart problem? Um, certainly gallbladder stones and medical conditions like high cholesterol, high triglycerides have got a big connection because... Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, one of the ingredients of the of bile is cholesterol. So when there's too much of cholesterol in the blood, and if there's too much of cholesterol floating around in the bile, it puts you at an increased risk of development of cholesterol stones. Uh, diabetes patient, diabetic patients have also got an increased predisposition for high cholesterol, high triglycerides, and so that can indirectly, um, uh, uh, you know increase the chances of uh, gallbladder stones. Um, certain medical conditions which make the gallbladder contraction go less um, and make the bile remain more stagnant can increase the chances of development of gallbladder stones. You know, the uh, there are so many uh, med medical conditions like that. I can give you just a couple of examples. Say, if somebody um, has had a bariatric surgery, a weight loss surgery, for example, one of the uh, reasons why uh, gallbladder contracts is hormone production from the upper part of the digestive system in response to food. And when food bypasses a particular part of the digestive system and goes straight into the intestines, that hormone production becomes less. And because that becomes less, the gallbladder contraction becomes less. And therefore, there's more stasis and so people get developed stones. So, and there's also another condition called gallbladder dyskinesia, which means inherently the contractile power of the gallbladder is less. So when, when the contraction is less, stasis is more and stones develop. That can happen in a wide variety of medical conditions. 
Doctor, we'll take some questions from our viewers. Right. Uh, can gallbladder stones be cleared by drinking more water, like we do for kidney stones? Yeah, I, I think that's a very good question. This is a question that is uh, asked by patients when they come to see uh, doctors, you know, people like me, either surgeons or medical gastroenterologists. Uh, short answer: No. Uh, kidney stones, gall stones are two completely different conditions. They are both stones, but then they have different characteristics and obviously they are in different organs. Kidney is a different organ <laughs> from the uh, gallbladder. So, kidney stones, um, there is some benefit in drinking plenty of water because if their stones are really, really tiny, um, by increasing the amount of water intake, by increasing the production of urine from the kidney, this, there is a possibility that the stones could be uh, could be flushed out. But gall stones don't work that way. Uh, number one, drinking water doesn't uh, directly translate into uh, production of excess bile. Uh, remember, there's no water flowing in that bile system. It's all bile. There's no water. Now, none of what you're drinking or eating is actually flowing in that system where stones are present. So, um, so that by, by drinking plenty of water, you're not going to push anything down, number one. And number two, even if it was a, a hypothetical situation where you have managed to push everything down, where are you pushing it into? You're pushing it into the bile duct. So, gallstones coming out or getting pushed out into the bile duct, it's not going to solve the problem. It's going to make the problem even worse because the bile duct has got a sphincter right at the bottom of it. We call it a sphincter of body. And these stones, if they, in a, let's assume in a hypothetical situation, we have fragmented all these stones with some special technique and we've made them um, into tiny, tiny, tiny particles and we're drinking plenty of whatever and getting them to flush down the bile duct. They're all going to go down and get stuck at the ampulla of water or the sphincter of body, which is the which is the outlet of that bile duct. And they're going to sit there causing more problems because they're going to block the bile, cause jaundice. And as I said before, they can block the pancreatic duct too and cause pancreatitis. So that's not going to happen. Medically speaking, that kind of a, a probability, that kind of a, of a sequence of events doesn't ever happen with drinking plenty of water. Hi, doctor. I am a vegetarian. Uh, and I still uh, had to suffer from gallbladder stones. How is it possible? It is still possible. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, uh, thinking that you will not develop gallbladder stones because you are a vegetarian is not correct. Uh, uh, scientifically speaking, um, gall stones can occur in any individual, whether they are vegetarians or uh, um, or mixed, or someone who takes a mixed diet, it has got to do with the amount of cholesterol in the body. Um, if you have a high, I mean, one of the reasons is high cholesterol. So even if you are a vegetarian, if if you take a, a lot of uh, fatty foods, high cholesterol and high triglycerides uh, in the body can predispose you to developing uh, cholesterol stones, and you can get cholesterol related problems. We'll take one final question, doctor. Now that I don't have a gallbladder, should I completely avoid heavy meal? Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, also a very, very good question because um, patients often think that they have lost their ability to digest food properly because of the lack of gallbladder. Far from true. Let me explain to you. Gallbladder is only a storage organ. Bile is secreted by the liver. So, liver is the secretory organ. Gallbladder is a storage organ as far as bile is concerned. We all need bile for normal digestion of our food. The bile that comes from the liver stays in the gallbladder for a, for a bit and then uh, gets into the uh, intestine. And intestine is where all the digestion happens. By having the gallbladder removed, you are not doing anything to the secretory part of it. You are only removing the storage component. So, the bile, the quantity of it, the quality of it is still exactly the same and it flows from the liver except that it doesn't uh, get stored, it goes straight into the intestines. Therefore, the digestion that happens to you will be will be fine. Uh, so, uh, there is no dietary 
modification there's no dietary restriction as such after laparoscopic cholecystectomy whatever you were uh, eating before you can eat after the operation of course there are some general dietary advice that all of us need to follow whether you've had a gallbladder taken out or you have a gallbladder it's a healthy dietary um, uh, advice that uh, we are we're all familiar with which is avoidance of too much of oil avoidance of too much of fatty food avoidance of too much of spices uh, avoidance of too much of fizzy drinks and these kind of stuff so that that general advice remains whether you are a post op patient or you are somebody who has got no no medical uh, no 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 gallstone related problems but then uh, assuming that have to be on a strict diet lifelong um, after gallbladder surgery or assuming that your digestion will always be um, below par for the rest of your life assuming that you can never have a good uh, uh, heavy meal or never have a party meal for the rest of your life uh, because you've had your gallbladder taken out is completely wrong what would be your message to our viewers today doctor what i would like to say is that uh, gallbladder stones related problems uh, are fairly common in the society it used to be called a disease of the west many many decades ago but not anymore we see a lot of it in india as well uh, similarly it used to be called disease of uh, uh, middle aged people and obese people but then now we our understanding of gallbladder stones has has evolved and we 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 realize that it is not just the obese people and the middle aged people who get these trouble there are lots of uh, other groups of people also who get uh, gallstone related problems so uh, one needs to be aware of uh, uh, gallstone related problems the kind of things that we just talked about and uh, if and when someone gets uh, diagnosed with gallstones and gets symptoms because of it it's very important that he or she seeks medical attention the treatment for symptomatic gallstone is only a laparoscopic cholecystectomy there's no second thought about it but if it is asymptomatic there is a role for waiting and watching but that needs to be done after a careful frank and an honest uh, uh, informed discussion between the doctor and the and the, and the patient the general uh, health related advice remains you know you've got to keep away from oily food and spicy food and too much of a fatty diet and so on and so forth lastly having the gallbladder removed uh, because of uh, such illnesses does not uh, incapacitate you in any way and does not affect your short term or long term health thank you very much doctor that was a very detailed and a very informative session on understanding all we needed to know about gallbladder disorders which affects other organs as well and leading to complications Thank you so much for the session. For appointments with Dr. J K A Jamil, Senior Consultant, Surgical Gastroenterology and Minimal Access Surgery at Apollo Hospitals, Greens Road, Chennai, please contact zero four 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 zero four zero one zero double six. I repeat, for appointments with Dr. J K A Jamil, Senior Consultant, Surgical Gastroenterology and Minimal Access Surgery at Apollo Hospitals, Greens Road, Chennai. Please contact zero four 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 zero four zero one zero double six. Thank you, doctor. Thank, Thank you, you very viewers. much. Thank you very much for having me.